Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to uh, stand in front of you and uh, talk about something that I had a chance really just to watch. I was sort of the executive leader for the hospital. Uh, and uh, the great thing about it is when you get to be as old as I am, you get to do these things, then you get to take credit for them, yeah, even though everybody else uh, was uh, doing all the work. So it's a good thing. I'd especially like to note my colleague, Dr. Tara Palmore, uh, who was one of the physicians who provided great care for this patient, uh, or one of the, the sickest patients that I'll tell you about in a second. I do want to tell you that my spouse, uh, after 30 years in the Food and Drug Administration, now works for Merck. Uh, I would also like to tell you that she's been trying to tell me what to say for 30 years, but has not been successful yet. So my goal uh, with you uh, today is to describe the planning and preparation for receiving and treating patients uh, with Ebola virus disease at the Clinical Center at the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. I'd like to describe the unanticipated events that were associated with the provision of care for Ebola virus patients, and then talk just a little bit about lessons learned at the end. So uh, we'll start by talking about our containment unit. It's really very interesting to hear the similarities of the programs uh, in various places. If you heard, have heard Dr. Ribner from Emory, uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the uh, unit uh, here uh, and ours are all very similar. As were the preparations and planning, ours was sort of unusual, and so I'll tell you about that uh, just a little bit to begin with. Then we'll talk about the unanticipated events and our lessons learned. So just to give you a little historical uh, context, our unit was not actually built uh, uh, for this purpose. Uh, the NIH tends to uh, take advantage of certain situations when they arise. And so uh, when there was a circumstance where there was uh, bioterrorism in the United States and anthrax was passed around, there was some money from Congress the Department of Defense decided that they were going to study these pathogens about 30 miles away from NIH. And historically, they had had this room that was lovingly called the Slammer. Uh, and the Slammer, apparently, if you got exposed to one of these agents while you were working uh, up at Frederick, they just threw you in the room and closed the door. And if you came out, you came out. And if you didn't, you didn't. No one ever died in the slammer, but it was a terrible place. I got to visit it a couple of times, uh, and it was a terrible thing. And so when we got this opportunity to build a unit, we got help from the Department of Defense, uh, and the idea was that we would provide care in this unit to any patient who got exposed to any of the select agents that they might be working with uh, up at uh, Fort Detrick. The one codicil we had uh, is that all the patients have to be enrolled in, one, in at least one clinical research protocol because that's what we do at the clinical center. It's a hospital that's entirely dedicated to clinical research. Um, so we, we got started. Uh, we looked at all the pathogens, at least they would tell us they were working with at Fort Detrick, uh, and uh, we dev devised a whole variety of different infection control approaches for providing care with patients with all kinds of select agents. And then we started drilling our staff uh, back in 2009 uh, to take care of, of hemorrhagic fever this or anthrax that, a lot of other uh, uh, kinds of uh, select agent diseases. This is our unit, uh, and I, is, there a, there is, is there a pointer? I, so in the, in the lower, in the lower left-hand uh, side, I'll use my finger and be impolite. Is there a, is this? Oh, here we go, thank you. So this is, this is the highest containment room here, and it's really quite analogous, I think a little smaller to, than the one that's in Geneva. But it has a great ante room and an equipment room. Uh, you could set the laboratory up uh, basically in the patient, at, at the patient's bedside. And in this unit, there are three other rooms. There are two bedded rooms uh, that was designed, as I said, if, in case several people got exposed to something. Those rooms could work. They have separate air handling and could work as isolation rooms, but I think uh, would not be ideal because if you make them isolation rooms, they don't have an ante room, then the whole corridor becomes the warm area. Uh, that's warm. Uh, and the only cold area, then you have to back off to get to the vestibule and the uh, nurse's area. And I was most comfortable providing care for only one patient at a time. 
thanks to m multiple conversations, I really echo the last speaker because being able to talk to the people who are doing it is so much help. Uh, so be, talking to Bruce Ribner and having Dr. Ribner tell us that trash is a deal, that really trash is in, an enormous problem in providing care for these patients. Uh, before we got our first sick patient, we actually added the area uh, to this unit that's circled in green. In there are two uh, medium-sized autoclaves and a huge autoclave that the staff refer to as Big Bertha, uh, which can uh, really autoclave the, autoclave the trash as it's coming out of the unit and move it into the waste stream. And that helped us enormously. I'll come back to that. This is what our room looks like. It looks very similar to the one you saw from Geneva. Um, and some of the points that I would make about planning and preparation are also quite similar. Teamwork is essential. Uh, this is not a prima donna game. This is a team sport. You really have to have the entire team engaged, and they have to really be playing at their 100% level uh, from the very start. You also have to collect input from every team member, because everyone who goes into that room or participates in the project really will have something to say about it, and you learn from what they have to say. It's equally important to engage institutional leadership. The, the director of the hospital, the, the director of the unit, the director of nursing, everyone has to be engaged and understand that, as the last speaker said, uh, your ICU staff are going to be cut in half, probably, or more, and you're going to have to figure out how to provide care for the rest of the patients in the ICU while you turn uh, to this particular problem. A very interesting issue was the issue of who's in charge here. Now, this may be somewhat unique to the National Institutes of Health, but one of the unique things about the National Institutes of Health is everyone I've met there uh, in my 36 years of experience at NIH not only thinks they are the best person in the world doing their own job, they think they can do your job uh, better than you can as well. And they're happy to tell you about that. And so in a situation like this, literally everyone wanted to be in charge. So, and everyone had a good argument why they should be in charge. So you have to choose someone and make that person be in charge. In this instance, it was Rick Davey, who's the deputy clinical director for NIAID, and he did a phenomenal job. You have to work through precautions and procedures, develop and test standard operating procedures, train, 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 and then practice, practice, practice. So all of a sudden, it went from the hypothetical uh, of training for all of these various possible infectious diseases that we might someday see to the real, where we thought we were really going to start getting Ebola patients. So we were one of three centers that the U.S. federal government was sending these uh, patients to. And that really put a different spin on things. And one thing I will comment is a lot of the training that took place between 2009 and, 19, or, and uh, 2014 was probably wasted because people would say, well, if we had a real patient, I would do this, or, or I would be putting this on. You have to do it. And under the threat of having a real sick patient come, uh, the, the training took on a different tenor. We prepared training materials for everybody involved. We ordered additional supplies. Uh, we actually used PAPRs uh, to provide care, and I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, we developed a cadre of volunteers. I'm not sure if I had it to do again, I would do that, uh, but that's the way we chose to do it uh, when we began. So uh, we had a staff of nurses and docs who were hired to work in the containment unit, but that was not an adequate number of physicians or nurses. And so we asked our staff to volunteer, and fortunately we got enough volunteers in every category. We trained our critical care specialists, nurses, infectious disease physicians first off. Uh, and as you heard from Geneva, uh, simulation played a significant role in our training. Uh, and a very interesting aspect of that uh, is the, that uh, you think you know how you're going to do it, you have a plan for doing it, and then you start to simulate it and you learn that your plan doesn't work. And it's a very important concept. And we focused on uh, donning and doffing. Uh, that, and that is clearly, I think, one of the highest risk things that anyone does in the care of these patients. We put these patients at the clinical center in a category called special respiratory isolation. Uh, in the inner room, here on the left, uh, it's full personal protective equipment, contact 
droplet plus airborne precautions. And in the ante room, we use one level down, uh, which is just contact and droplet precautions. This is Dr. Palmore and her garb. So why did we do that? Well, we did that because when we trained from 2009 on, we trained for high containment. So the staff who was dedicated to that unit were already really quite comfortable at that level of care. And so we chose to stick with it. I think you could probably provide the same level of care uh, for patients with a lower level, but we were comfortable with it. Um, we also thought it was a conservative approach because we didn't know, we'd never had a patient with Ebola before. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, our staff who tried N95s and other approaches were less comfortable actually in that gear than they were uh, wearing uh, pappers. They were actually more comfortable and could stay in the rooms longer. And then we also uh, relaxed precautions as we would with any infectious disease. That actually caused a lot of uh, heartburn uh, with our uh, senior staff. But when a patient is no longer infectious, the patient's no longer infectious. So you come off the isolation precautions. Many people would like to have kept those patients in isolation until the second they left the hospital. We developed a flexible staffing model. We tried to anticipate laboratory requirements. Uh, we knew we were going to need reliable, responsive e Ebola testing. Uh, it's hard to get that in our neck of the woods, and so we contracted with our colleagues at Fort Detrick in Frederick, who do it all the time. Uh, we expanded our point of care testing in the patient's room uh, with uh, the very self-same devices that you've seen in other places. Uh, and we ordered other tests with trepidation. Uh, we had a few instances where we went because of the concern about a possible gram-negative sepsis that we wanted microbiological studies done. And we were able to work with our colleagues at Fort Detrick to do that. We have in our hospital, uh, because of the fear of pandemic influenza about seven or eight years ago, uh, we have a, a BSL-3 laboratory in our clinical laboratory that ended up functioning as the uh, Ebola laboratory uh, outside the point of care testing lab. We worked hard to build consensus, and that's part of the team building process. There was an incredible amount of storming and norming. We had the spraying uh, controversy. It went on for about a week. Uh, no one, half people didn't want to spray uh, in the Western Hemisphere, and the other half thought you had to spray. And we had a daily debriefing, which sometimes turned into an argument, uh, but most often uh, worked through problems, and we were able to figure out uh, exactly uh, what we needed to do next. I told you that we had core staffing in the unit. Uh, we did not allow trainees to provide care for these patients. We had uh, volunteers from nursing, infectious diseases, and critical care. And we used the buddy system. I think most places use the buddy system where there are two nurses in the room at all times, one nurse in the ante room, and one nurse at the nurse's station. And pretty soon you don't have any other available nurses because it, it's so labor intense. We also use trained observers. And I would advocate the use of a trained observer probably at the 100% level. For us, it was critical. And I'll come back to that in just a second. But it is really an important uh, concept that we learned from Billy Fisher, who had come back from Africa, where they have trained observers all the time. And he's, he explained to us what they do and how they help you. And they sure, surely did. As I mentioned, we relied on the simulation lab. Uh, we then took the simulation to the, to the actual unit and found out that a lot of things that we've been doing in our simulation lab didn't work. We worked, again, through the details of the precautions and procedures. One of the mantras has to be be flexible. Sometimes seemingly excellent plans just simply don't work. We planned on having a clear trans transparent communications plan uh, we planned to communicate with hospital staff, patients, other folks on our campus. There are about 18 or 20,000 people who work on the NIH campus. We have three adjacent hospitals to ours, and so we wanted to communicate with them. Some other neighbors, there's a, a private school that's right across the street from NIH that every time something like this happens, uh, the principal of the school gets very anxious. And so that person is on our list now. We worked hard with our state and lo local public health authorities, with the local community, the press, and the public. And we worked with each other uh, 
each of our patients to try to maintain the patient's medical privacy and confidentiality. I talked a little about this. Here's the setup in one of the laboratories that's really very simplistic. For disinfection, we used uh, bleach or hydrogen peroxide. We used hydrogen peroxide vapor to disinfect uh, the patient's room and any reusable equipment, such as the x-ray machine that went in and out. And here are the, the pictures that are similar to the movie that you saw. Uh, the patient coming during the day here and another one arriving at night. Uh, when the first patient came, our first sick patient uh, was the first nurse from Dallas. And so when she arrived, uh, there were 17 satellite trucks sitting in front of the hospital. So we, in, in our uh, discussions, we said, wow, we don't like that. And somebody said, you know, we have a private reservation. We don't have to let the satellite trucks onto the reservation. And that was the last we saw of them, and that worked. So these are the things that I've put into the category of unanticipated events. At the top of the list is patient assignment. We never knew up until 36 hours before, in some instances, 24 hours before in others, when we were going to get a patient. And sometimes there didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason why we were getting this patient and Nebraska wasn't or Emory wasn't. Uh, it wasn't like there was a rotation and we were up. Uh, it was that they, we got a call and the patient was coming, and we didn't have the option of saying no takes. Uh, we, we get the patient and the patient comes. Um, that decision is made, I think, by the State Department uh, of all places in the United States government because they have the contract with the airplane. And so they're the ones who decide where, where it goes. Transportation is a significant issue. Um, things I never thought about about this. So our first patient actually didn't land. There are three metropolitan Washington, D.C. airports, Dulles, Baltimore, Washington International, and National. And our patient landed at the Frederick, Maryland Municipal Airport. So we had done all of our planning, talking to the people at Dulles, talking to the people at National, talking to the people at BWI. And so now the person's coming into Frederick, Maryland. We'd never talked to the mayor of Frederick, uh, to the city council. All of those people really believe that they need to be a part of this. You're going to be driving that patient through their county. And so that's a major issue for those folks. And it was not trivial. There were other aspects of transportation that were equally challenging. Here is uh, our sickest patient arriving. Uh, and you can see that he's in the containment unit in the plane. Uh, our usual drill was to have the patient put on garb uh, and move from the State Department's isolation pod to our isolation pod. We slip them into the ambulance and take them to the clinical center. In this instance, the patient got the garb on, uh, stood up and collapsed, ripped the garb. Uh, it was a huge mess, and they had no idea what to do, so they put him back in the State Department's isolation pod. Terrific. That's fine. Great. We'd never seen one of those before. We had no idea how it worked. Sometimes necessity is the mother of invention. So how were we going to get the patient out of the plane? The same way United Airlines would. Here you see the patient coming down the luggage ramp, right into the ambulance, in the pod, and safely delivered into the ambulance and then to the clinical center uh, where he got, I think, terrific care. Another major issue that was brought up uh, by several of the other speakers is managing the hysteria and anxiety. Uh, I am so old that I was at the clinical center when we started getting patients who had this new disease that was then called AIDS. Uh, and it was even more frightening because we didn't know what caused it in those days. And the doctors and nurses who worked in our hospital had 550 then HIV infected patients, we didn't know it at the time, and uh, admitted to the hospital before we had any idea what caused that disease. There was a huge amount of hysteria. There were a lot of people who thought we shouldn't be doing that work, and a lot of people on my staff who would stand at the microphone and berate us uh, for taking the risk of killing all of Montgomery County, Maryland, or all of their patients, or all of a lot of other people. Uh, and it was fascinating. Uh, that the same people 
are still there and said the same things at the same microphones. It seemed impossible to me. It was like that horrible movie Groundhog Day uh, where it comes back to visit you every time. So that's a major issue, managing the hysteria and anxiety, and you have to plan for it. And you have to, I think, take it on head on. You can't slide off of it. The way you manage that is by careful communication. And as I told you, we thought we had a good plan, but then we had problems uh, with folks worried about things. So we had multi uh, daily multidisciplinary meetings. We had communications that went out from uh, my boss's desk, the director of the hospital, went out emails. We had town hall meetings with our staff. We wrote a white paper about the uh, biology and epidemiology and transmission and transmissibility of Ebola and just distributed it throughout the hospital. Uh, we communicated consistently with public health officials, with the media and the public, but we do have an ace in the hole. And I don't know if you recognize this guy. This is Anthony Fauci, who's the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. He's one of the most thoughtful, most careful public spokespeople for these kinds of issues that I've ever seen in my life. And Tony really, really uh, can talk to the public and the press and does it with a plum. So here's a very interesting uh, uh, picture that I pulled off the web. It's not my original. It shows you the correlation between, or lack thereof, the epidemic in Western Africa shown in the gray bars and the uh, Ebola Google search traffic and what seems to drive that. The things that don't drive it are the Doctors Without Border uh, calling the outbreak unprecedented, had no effect. Uh, but when uh, Ebola was declared a public health emergency, uh, it had gone up quite a bit. But the thing that seemed to drive that was when Kent Brantley was brought back from Africa with Ebola virus infection and taken to Emory University Hospital. So that's this bleep. Uh, and here you can see when Mr. Duncan came from Liberia to Dallas, uh, and you can see that that seemed to cause quite a surge in the uh, Google activity, uh, unrelated again uh, to the occurrence of the epidemic. And when the two nurses uh, were diagnosed with uh, Ebola, that was the highest uh, search hits uh, for the whole slide. So these are the faces of the folks uh, that we've provided care for in the United States. Um, as was alluded to earlier, there are two things about this I like, because all but one of the people on this slide is alive, uh, which is a really good finding. Dr. Uh, Salia, who really, they had no chance with at Nebraska. He, he was effectively dead on arrival. He was, we waited too long to take him out. The other two things, things I'm really proud of are the two in the right-hand corner. Uh, those are two patients who were treated at the clinical center, and you don't know who they are. And I'm really proud of that, because they didn't want people to know who they were. And we were able to do that despite the fact that we were hounded by the press consistently. One of those was the very, very, very sick patient. Tony Fauci says the sickest patient he's ever seen get well. Waste management, I mentioned earlier, it was a huge problem. Bruce Ribner told us that there'd be more waste than you'd ever imagined, and there was. <laughs> um, but it was not just the waste stream. We had problems with human waste, with the waste stream from the room, and even with uncontaminated waste. So I'll go through it quickly. Uh, the Washington, Washington Suburban Sanitary District called us up and said, what are you doing with the human waste from these patients? We said, it says on the CDC website, you flush it down the toilet. They said, if you do, we're going to disconnect you. I'm not fooling. They said, we'll disconnect you. So we developed a strategy to do that. But it's a little complicated because in our nice new hospital, we had automatic flushing toilets. These are things you don't think about, OK? The toilet flushes automatically, so you have to unhook that. And then we put this elegant sign over it, so uh, please don't flush the toilet, because you have to wait to let it dwell with the chemicals uh, for 20 minutes before you can flush it. So our waste stream, I told you about the autoclaves. We thought we were really smart. Uh, and so the way that was supposed to work, about, on average, I would say someplace in the neighborhood of um, between 170 and 270 of those boxes of medical pathological waste per patient. So it's not quite a semi-load per patient, but it's a lot of trash. So our plan was, once it had autoclaved, it was sterile, obviously, we would box it up 
and ship it off to our incinerator where it would then be incinerated and sent off to the landfill. However, the man who ran the landfill, uh, the incinerator guy was fine with it. The man who ran the landfill said he didn't want Ebola ashes in his landfill and he refused to take ashes from the incinerator. Ebola ashes, the, the elemental carbon and phosphorus is somehow different uh, from the, I don't know. But so we were, in, we were stuck. So we were accumulating the trash on campus in a big room uh, until finally our friends at Fort Detrick, uh, we figured out that they have their own incinerator and their own landfill and so they could do it for us and so we're off the hook for that. Even uncontaminated waste in the nurse's station, the housekeepers initially would not enter the unit to get it. The few housekeepers who were brave enough to do it were ostracized by the others. No one would get near them. And so we had multiple meetings with them and th this didn't work. And finally, reason uh, solved the problem. Uh, the, the way reason solved the problem was they're a contract group and the guy who runs the contract said they weren't gonna get paid unless they did it. And so I, that was the reason that helped with that. Staff consequences, we have, we have nurses uh, who uh, had kids in daycare uh, who were told that if they continued to do this, they uh, could not have their kids in daycare. The, uh, just a word about the Watson. The, the Watson, the person's, uh, it's a portmanteau of water and sanitation, basically watches you take it, put everything on and take everything off and they do it by a script. If you do anything wrong, they say stop and that's the only person who can stop everything in the room. One of my critical care doctors came to me downstream after one of these events and said, I think you saved my life. Um, we got unusual training requests. I won't talk about those. We had one horrible combat combative patient. We had two nurses in the room. It wasn't enough. It takes five or six more minutes to get somebody into the room. And then we had our improvements from hot, hot washes. So, Lessons learned, resolve who will be in charge. We were stunned at the passion with which people clung to beliefs or opinions that were not grounded in science. Uh, we've already heard about the importance of a team and we've learned that this is a formidable disease. We also learned that what we thought we knew, we didn't know because saliva stays positive longer, sweat, and who knows how long semen does. The sickest patients have multi-system disease and almost every possible disease can be involved. The next speaker is going to talk about sequelae, and I'll let that person do that. About countermeasures, I would like to echo uh, what Dr. Kaiser and uh, Dr. Schiebler said. Uh, there is a need for rigorous controlled trials. So let me just close with this. Uh, this is our sickest patient who was enrolled in a study of receiving either ZMAP or nothing. And here you can see the time of admission of ZMAP. Uh, and if we sent that off to the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, they would say how wonderful it works, except he didn't get anything. He was randomized to nothing. And so uh, we need those clinical trials. Going forward, improved public health infrastructure, humanitarian assistance, careful implementation of safe and effective care strategies, meticulous attention to infection control, contact tracing, effective internal and external communication, careful evaluation of countermeasures for safety and efficacy, and iterative feedback and improvement about the clinical processes we're using. Thank you very much for your time and attention.